Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Um, we're going to start a, a little bit differently uh, this afternoon. First, just by way of introduction, I'm Mac. Mm -hmm. This is Myra. This is what we call our Sunday. And, um, you know, normally we go through a thing. I, I do a little sh uh, upfront just introduction, and she goes right into prayer and sharing this uh, topic. Um, but today, uh, I've already asked her permission to do a little commentary up front. Bottom line, guys, is that um, we cannot ignore what took place on yesterday as far as the uh, the former president Donald Trump's uh, assassination attempt, and it really was an assassination attempt that took place at a rally in Philadelphia. Um, we are sitting here in, in Guatemala, but news of that was just all over the place, and uh, we spent most of the later evening looking at uh, different accounts that came from all types of sources, from uh, news sources, from also uh, YouTube commentaries and uh, so many things. And we want to probably have a pretty serious tone about not just what happened yesterday, but just our overall lesson, which interesting enough was already in play. This is nothing that we um, <laughs> came up with in response to, <laughs> excuse me, the, the assassination attempt. And even more importantly about the uh, civilian lives that were taken and those who were injured as part of this assassination attempt. And we take it very seriously uh, when we are literally seeing the scriptures play out in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to say automatically that none of this surprises us uh, because we can see in the atmosphere that the tone of the world is continuously going into a moral quagmire. And it's amazing how it's reflected even more so in the United States, the really the baby country of the world, in that we're supposed to be established as the quote Christian nation, at least Christian nation, as far as the formation of our laws that uh, definitely took on the biblical principles that uh, we read according to God's word, if not necessarily enacted in that same manner. But yesterday showed aside, not so much for the world, because the world is the world and the world doesn't disappoint. If there's anything that's going to be said that's immoral or condescending or uh, without compassion, without love, the world is guaranteed to give it to you. What has, you know, touched us and me in particular is the Christian or so-called Christian reaction to what has taken place. And it's been uh, incredible to see literally the falling away of people that are purporting to live by the standards of the Bible. Yet when things happen, even to our enemies, that those things are not taken in prayer, um, accusations and just out and out 
rude comments and memes and all types of things just are flying all over the place. And these are not just the world. These are coming from people that have purported to be uh, Christians and people that I know some, excuse me, that um, it is, it's triggered something in me, Myra, and our audience. It's, it's triggered something in me that I didn't really sleep that well. I got up early. I've been thinking about it. And so I, I want to start off just reading a scripture that came to mind. And forgive me, guys, because I've been um, dealing with a little bit of a virus. So uh, pray for Myra. She's being very brave to sit next to me right now. <laughs> but um, it's coming out of First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading the New English translation. But I just want you all to take this in because this is setting the tone for our topic, government over God. Because I put it as a question. Uh, so it says, first of all, then I urge that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanks be offered on behalf of all people, mm -hmm. even for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Such prayer for all is good and welcomed before God, our Savior. Since he wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one intermediary between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself human, who gave himself as a ransom for all, revealing God's purpose at his appointed time. I wanted to read that because there, there are requirements for all those who profess to be followers of Christ. We're going to go on the record. If we haven't gone on the record before today, we're going to go on record now to say that we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in his word without a doubt in our hearts and minds. And we see the Holy Scriptures as God's way of communicating his will towards us to reveal who he is and to expose who we are with and without him. And that's what the, the scriptures do. And everything gets exposed, not in times that are prosperous and times that are of plenty, but things get exposed in times of tragedy, times of confusion, times of anarchy, times of abuse. This is when the cream truly rises to the top and we see everything for what it is. So right now, before I, I turn this over to Myra, I'm speaking to everyone who has professed their faith in Christ, who have put out horrible uh, posts, whether it's about uh, former President Trump, whether it's about current President Biden, whether it's about anyone or anything. For all of you who profess the faith, who put uh culture over Christ mm. for all of you all who don't understand that life begins with God 
And no man, no woman has any authority when life is created other than to assure that that life comes to fruition, no matter the circumstances. We don't have an abortion issue in the family of faith. We do not have a DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, in the family of faith. We don't have CRT, critical race theory, in the household of faith. Even what we're talking about today speaks to the fact of what's more important in this life. Who, how do we represent in this life? Do you just see yourself as conservative? Do you see yourself as a moderate? Do you see yourself as a liberal, right wing, uh, left wing, radical? What what are we doing? And I'm talking in the Christian world. Who are we supposed to be representing? Who is in fact? our government, and why is it that every opportunity that we have in order to actually demonstrate that government to a world that is going into the abyss, why is it that we fall for the okie doke and the parlor tricks of Satan to divide and to separate on issues that have nothing to do with God's agenda? And I've got to tell you, I am today, I'm going to admit it, I am speaking out of an emotional uh, place, but I pray that it's a controlled one, and I'm not going to fall for the trick of just being angry without talking about a solution to all of this, and we know it already. The solution is Christ. The answer is Christ. It, it starts and ends with Christ. Anything that is outside of his prism is not going to work. So if you are calling yourself a person of faith, if you are saying that you are a believer and you are spewing hate and vitriol on a situation, I, I, I'm telling you guys, we are admonished so many times in scriptures to love our enemies. It doesn't mean condone our enemies. It doesn't mean to accept our enemies or conform to our enemies, but love. And that love is the love that only can come from God. God is the only one that can teach you the kind of love that even when those are smiting you, you understand that they're not doing it because of you. They are doing it because of Christ. And you take it and you take all the abuse. And I know that whatever Myra and I share today, we already understand that it will not be received by everyone. And that's okay because you have that right. But we also have a right to actually stand up for the gospel, not in a way that is about apologetics, but in a way that just simply shows our faith without embarrassment, without uh, any uh, apprehension that we are faithful, I would dare say slaves to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be a slave, that's the only slave that I'm going to be. I'm going to be a slave to his word. She is going to be a slave to his word. And ultimately, even in the areas where we personally fall short, our prayer is always help us, oh God, to be better in our walk with you. Help us to be better in our marriage. Help us to be better as parents. Help us to be better as people. Help us to be better in our communities. Help us to be better in your ministry, oh God, so that you will be glorified. This is not about us. This is about the fiber of what God has put us on this planet in order to do. And yesterday 
was the beautiful opportunity for the family of faith to show up and show out and overthrow the uh, people like On The View or MSNBC or CNN and all of the uh, haters and the the proponents of evil that continue to spew hate, mm-hmm. to, to, to look at people. I don't care which person we're talking about. This is not a political message we're talking about here. I'm just saying that every time you, you attack an individual without having the full account, you are literally slandering fathers and husbands and 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 uh you know sons uh uncles aunts that people are attached to the ones who we are super critical of and they are the collateral damage or they deal with the collateral damage of your hate christians i'm not right now i'm not even talking to the world i'm talking to you christians you who are dancing and jumping and falling out and speaking in tongues and and running around churches and you come out and you throw hate speech on social media and it's so easy to do that on a platform where nobody can touch you and it's it's discouraging i literally in the midst of our worship experience today I just happened to see a post by somebody I love. And it was so anti-Christ. It's no other way I can put it. And I showed Myra and it was like unbelievable. And I'm just saying, guys, yesterday is a is an occurrence that should be a wake-up call for everybody. We have got to stop hating on each other. As far as us in the United States, it literally Mm. is creating a separation that will be worse than any civil war or any genocide that you can imagine. Because again, people, a house divided against itself will fall. So the next time that you listen to the Joy Behars or um, the um, Joy Reeds or the Jamel Hills or the Bill Rileys or the, um, oh gosh, I can't even think, the John Stewart's, when you, when you, you know, when you, when you listen to them, Do they ever bring solutions to the table that include love? Do they ever talk about anything positive? Do they ever take into consideration anything other than their personal agendas? I want you to think on that. Excuse me. I want you to meditate on that because this is serious and I'm getting ready to turn this over to Myra right now, but but understand this, everybody. Um, we don't know how much time we have left. And I'd rather live this existence that's coming out of First mm-hmm. Timothy 2 than the one we're living right now. Sweetheart, it's yours. Okay. Governor, Thank you, darling. over God, is the government more important than god that's an issue i think that we need to really deal with as christians because we're looking just like the world in a lot of ways and the decisions that we make um and as mac was speaking it reminded me so much of the the thing that got me the week before was some comments about the 2025 project which I'd never heard of before. And that made me just think some more and I'm like, here's another thing that's gonna divide us. Here's another thing that um, is being interpreted based on 
other people's information, not based on anything in fact, but their fact. But does anybody ever investigate anything to find out what's going on? And that's, you know, so that made me think, well, where's God in this, you know? So I went to, it looks like we both went to the same place, but I went to 1 Samuel verse 8, and this is about Israel demands a king. Now, Samuel, the prophet, was definitely a prophet from God. He had been dedicated to the Lord at birth, even before he was born by his mom, by his mother. And he truly was a faithful prophet to God. There's there's no nothing in the Bible that talks negative about Samuel. But he had, he was getting old and he he had two sons, his heart. And he made his sons judges over Israel. But neither one of the sons were good. They didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. They turned away and they were doing dishonest things to gain money. They were taking bribes and they were doing things that were unjust. And it was so, it wasn't even undercover that much because everyone knew. So the elders, the leaders of Israel, they came to Samuel and they demanded a king. And the interesting, they, they demanded, look, they said, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They didn't come to Samuel and say, you know, let's discuss this. What are we going to do? This is the situation with your sons. They're not, you know, fulfilling their call like you were doing. Uh, they're not even qualified because they, the first things they do is dishonest. So do you have a solution? No, they didn't do that. They said, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations, like all the nations. And they're looking at other outside of their own nation for direction. That's the first thing that, that's, that's wrong right there. They're looking outside. They're not saying, ask God, what should we do? And this is a people that were founded on the principles of the word of God, his commandments, his laws, but they didn't do that. But you know what? It, Samuel was not happy because he because of what they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel, he prayed to the Lord and the Lord answered him. And he said, don't listen to the voice of the people and all that. He said, listen to the voice of the people, sorry, and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. They have rejected me that I should reign over them. And he's saying, go ahead, do what they want them to do, what they want you to do. Because it's not you they're rejecting, they're rejecting me. It, that's the wisdom of God. God is not a God that's going to put himself on us to say, you have to do this, you have to do that. All of us have free will, and he's always been that way. So he just says, go ahead, let them have what they want. Because it's not you they're rejecting, it's me. And that's, that's what is so evident in some of the things that are happening now. He says, everything they want he says according to all the works they have done since the day that i brought them out of egypt even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods so they are doing to you also he has seen nothing but rejection 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 after he delivered them it's another way of saying i saved these people and are they still walking with me? Are they listening to me? Are they heeding what I'm saying? No. If he says, I, I saved them. <laughs> <laughs> they have continuously served other gods. They, at that time, you know, there are other actual gods, but he's talking about the God of self, the God of wealth, all those other gods that were all around them that they wanted. I want more. I want this. I want that. And that's what they're getting from the other nations because they're, so they're surrounded by nations who do not believe in the one and true God. He says, okay, listen to them. But 
I want you to forewarn them of what's going to happen. Show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of, of the Lord to the people and asked him that had asked him for a king. And he said, Samuel said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. In other words, there's going to be a conscription. We need, we need men in my army. So they're going to be called up, even if they don't want to. They're farmers, they have families, they're taking care of their families, but it doesn't matter. They're going to have to come. These sons are going to have to come that have been helping their own families grow their wheat and, and grow their pr products, produce and do all the things that blesses their community. No, we're gonna take them and they're gonna serve the, the king. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties will set some to the plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He's telling them they'll have different positions in this army in this community that serves the king it's not it's not their choice like i want to be a soldier i want to do i want to make armaments no this is what they're going to do he will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants taxes you're going to be taxed and most where does the tax money go i know in guatemala just about every year Whatever the people pay, somebody goes off with it. And I believe that happens in the States too. You know, the, the taxes are paid and some of that money just disappears. It goes to where people who have influence. And he would take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, their donkeys and put them to work. So everybody's gonna be under the covering of the king. And he would take the tenth of your sheep. You, you work hard. But he's gonna, you're gonna have to give that to the government. And you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. The Lord's not gonna hear. He says, I'm not gonna hear you. I mean, for us, and and for some, especially for some of the parents now, it's it's been terrible. They're teaching things in the school that the parents don't agree. Not all of them. And most of them are Christians to do this. They don't agree with teaching sex education. They don't agree with uh, teaching them about other other options and sexes. They don't agree with that. And when they go to a school board, what happens? They're out of order because the government is now the king over everything. After the warning that God had given through through Samuel, they didn't care. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations <laughs> and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. Most of the, even David at one point did not go out to war anymore. He got corrupted and stayed home and, and things just got worse and worse. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice. Okay, listen to them and make them a king. And that's the beginning of the end. That was the beginning of the end where the government through a king was starting to take over. But you know what? New Testament, God is so good. First Peter, Timothy, sorry, too. God is a gracious God. He says, therefore, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. That's including the king. For kings and all who are in, in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior who desires all men to be saved. He's not praying for them to prosper in their lives, in their position. He's praying 
asking us to pray for them, that they would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That means we don't have enemies, just what Mac was saying, we don't have enemies in, in the government. There are people that we should be praying for. That's merciful. They have done things that are ungodly, but God has said, pray for them. And he says, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in our godliness and reverence. Because that reflects the peace of God and the calm of God in our lives and our reverence for not only God, for, but for humankind, even if they don't believe the way we believe. But we have reverence to God, so we obey him in, instead of being like the other nations. And that means here being like, well, we're not no, we're not in the States, but that means in the States being like the culture. <laughs> we should not be like the culture. We should be like children of God who obey God over government. Because the government, uh, what one of the one of the candidates said, if you, you if you're a Democrat, you can't uh, you can't vote Republican. Like, so that's a, an order. Because my my being a Democrat means I have to go this way. Well, if you're a Republican, you're not supposed to do this. Are you supposed to be like this? But where is God in that? You know, we don't follow labels. We shouldn't. We follow after God. In everything that happens, we follow after God. If we don't do that, we're going to be like the rank and file. We look like everybody else. And that's not living a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence unto him. Where is that expressed or evident in the Christian life of a lot of us Christians? That also took me to the 23rd Psalm. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, we know he's king, but he says, the Lord is my shepherd. This is written by David. And he, he he's using a shepherd to, to express his devotion to the Lord God Almighty because he knows that he is the provider. Because when you think about the other week, um, the, the teaching was about, uh, I think it's Spanish, about sheep. We are sheep. It says we are like sheep who have lost our way, gone astray, everyone to their own devices, basically. And we are, we're, we're like dumb sheep. We just follow whoever's leading us. But it says, I shall not want. Because this shepherd, he takes care of us if we follow him. He said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Because he knows that in the green pastures, that's where I can get what I need. I can get the nourishment. Not in no dry grass, green pastures, the best place. He makes me to rest in those places that I can be nourished. He leads me beside the still waters where I don't have to fight to get refreshment, replenishment in the water. He leads me beside the still waters where I can just take all of the water that I need. I don't have to fight for it in rapids and it's flying by and I'm trying to get some refreshment. He restores my soul. That means my soul needs to be restored probably daily because of all the minutia around us. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Is the government going to lead us in the path of righteousness? No, but he leads me in the path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Because being a Christian doesn't mean that everything is, is peaches and cream. No. In this life, we will have tribulations, mm -hmm. but be of good cheer because he overcame the world. 
We don't want to be like the culture. We want to be overcomers as he has overcome. So when those days come, we don't have to fear because he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. There's punishment there, correction there. But that head of that staff always pulls us back to him. So we can be comforted after we've been disciplined. Because that's not, I'm not going to discipline you and leave you out there. I'm going to discipline you and then show you how much I care for you. Because you are still my own. Never will I reject you. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Because the anointing of God it has to pour out into others. It doesn't stay with us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that, that presence of the goodness and mercy of God, that is, that's an influencer. That's an influencer. That's, that's the word they've been using on TikTok and all these other things. That person's an influencer. No, the goodness and mercy of God that follow me is, is the influencer all the days of my life, that others would want to taste and see what God is about because of how we represent him in our daily life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Is the government going to give us this? Is the government going to give us peace? Is the government going to restore us? So why will we put the government over God? He is, has established, he has allowed us to establish this government. And basically, as we've talked about before, it's, it's based on Judeo-Christian principles. And a lot is being said about, let's take that away. And that has been what has sustained us year after year after year. But now it's not respected. It's not, it's not talked about except in, oh, that's old. But you know what? The word of the Lord is forever true. It never changes. So the things that we're trying to, in this world, in this culture, to destroy, only will result in destroying us. Destroying everything that has been based on the principles of the Lord and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the anger, you know, I understand, you know, I... I take it differently than he does, but it's the same kind of indignation, same kind of sadness for me because I look at the value of who we are in Christ. And there's nothing that we've done to be called valuable. He has called us valuable as Christians. And we're defiling that by showing that we don't value him above everything. Mm. And if we don't value him above everything, then we don't have anything. We should not be in the midst of calamity, lies, mal intent, any of that. Speaking evil of people, making assumptions about me. We were talking about that with, with the, the pastor trying to figure out what did he do? I want to hear all of it. No, <laughs> that's between him and God. But when you see what is happening to our communities, what to our children, and we go along with it and say, that's fine, that people can make their own decisions. And not when it's a child, not when it's a baby. You know, we're we're heading down the path you talk about Hitler, we're heading down that same path. Because they, they're talking about, well, let's put a chip in your hand so we know, you know, have this information about you. Let's control. Let's look at the old people, you know, if they're too old, why should they live? What value do they have? So that's putting in, and they had euthanasia. And we've had that happen here. In some states, you can do that. You can you can have you can commit suicide legally. That is such a, a devaluation 
of the gift that we have. Now, I'm not saying those people did that of Christians, but we as Christians are like, well, if that's what they want to do. We don't stand up for the righteousness of God to say, no, for God I live, for God I die. We should not look like them. We should not be the ones that say, well, if that person has a, an, wants to have an abortion, I am not going to uh, stand up and say, oh, no, she shouldn't, unless it was sickness or something like that. It's just because it's inconvenient. Let's kill this baby. I, I'm, I need to go to school. I've got too many children I don't want to raise anymore. This child is an inconvenience. None of us should be looked at as an inconvenience because we are all born to be in, and created by our Savior and have the opportunity to accept him and to live a life that is pleasing to him. So my, my heart is, is, is not broken, but my heart is concerned because every day is something new and is not something good. <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't represent Christ. So as far as the government is concerned, by, was it November? When we vote, my suggestion is ask God. And how many times have you done that? God, I have issues with both of these men. Who do you want me to vote for? And let, have, have him make the decision for you. I can't say don't vote because that's all, that's all right. That's up to you. But if you're going to vote, Ask God. And if you if you don't like someone, keep it to yourself. Take it to God. Say, Lord, help me to pray for that person. I don't like what they do. I don't like who they are. I don't like who they, how they represent themselves in whatever form or fashion. But I want to pray for them. I want them to know you if they don't already know you. I want them to know you. We're praying for the salvation of our leaders, for our mayors, for our governors. You say, well, this is not worth it. Somebody prayed for you at one time. And Jesus has always been interceding for us. So we need to be united in our relationship with God, that God is first over country, over country, over government. We're not going to bring it down. It would lift it up and lead it into the paths of righteousness. But we know <laughs> that these are the dark and evil days. But let's say as we go down that road that more are gathered in and that the more that are gathered in Maybe some of these leaders that will represent Christ and someone could say, wow, look at that. I'm going to go read my Bible. We want to pray for those who may one day be influencers for the things of God. That's all we can do. Mm -hmm. That's what we're responsible for. Not to make judgments over people. Not to condemn people, but to pray for people to come to know the one and true living God. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. Well, if she didn't lie, um, we are coming from the same passage, which is... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And um, I saw so many correlations between what was going on at the time that this was written to what's going on right now uh, as it pertains to uh, what's going on in 
the United States uh, with the upcoming election and everything that goes with that. So I'm going to probably take what Myra has said and I'll probably flesh out a few things just uh, line by line, precept by precept. So before we even get to reading 1 Samuel 8, and we will read it in its entirety, it's, you've got to understand that this was during a time where God had established judges to rule over Israel. Basically, creating the theocracy that he wanted in place and that was best for the people, which would be God would be the king and the people who were in place as judges would be, let's say, his administration and the ones who would help carry out his statutes and laws and principles. So like everything else, it's Israel and, and, and God seem to always be in this breakup to make up and then break up again to make up because of Israel's disobedience, mostly uh, related to idolatry. And if you don't understand what idolatry is, that is the worship of any other God other than Yahweh. And so these things were put in place and Samuel, who acted as both prophet and judge, was in a situation as we are going into reading chapter eight, where he made a mistake. And I'm going to show you the mistake that he made, and it's, it's right in verse one. So understand this, every other judge that was put in place, including Samuel, was put in place by God. But in verse one of chapter eight, it says, in his old age. Now, isn't that interesting? Hint, hint. In his old age, probably at a time of having served the Lord, in fact, having been rejected because of the Lord, um, having served well, and, you know, things happen in old age. Moses made a mistake in old age, and Samuel's in old age, and Samuel went and made the same mistake that Way back, Eli made with his sons. If you all remember, Samson was dedicated by Hannah unto the priest. Eli was the priest, and Eli and his sons fell short of the expectations that God had in place. Well, here it says, in his old age, Samuel appointed his sons as judges over Israel. So again, guys, you have to read into what's happening here. It doesn't say that Samuel sought the Lord on this. Samuel, uh, it is uh, perceived that he wanted to give his sons a training ground. And that training ground, I'm kind of jumping the scripture a little bit, would end up being in uh, Beersheba. But he wanted to give them an opportunity to kind of test the waters. So he uh, took it upon himself to, uh, to appoint his sons as judges. And we'll read that that had a disastrous uh, outcome. So it says, in his old age, Samuel appointed his sons as judges 
over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second son was Abihah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. Instead, they made money dishonestly, accepted bribes, and perverted justice. Doesn't that sound like things that we could say about our current government today, that it lost its way uh, based upon the original uh, laws, again, the Charters of Freedom, as they are called, uh, the Bill of Rights, U.S. Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. Those are the, the three pillars that make up everything else. All the amendments that you uh, that have been created since that time were birthed, for better or for worse, from the original <clears throat> documents of freedom as we know them. So anyway, getting back to the text in verse four, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and approached Samuel at Ramah or Ramah. And they said to him, look, you are old and your sons don't follow your ways. So now appoint over us a king to lead us just like all the other nations have. And let me stop right there. So you see what is going on here is that instead of embracing the unique situation that God had placed over Israel as being Israel's sole king and just putting these judges in place by God's appointment, not by Samuel's or any other man's. The people, just like the children of Israel in Egypt, the people are never satisfied when God is in control. The United States is not satisfied whenever God is in control, when God's people are in control. Why? Because like it says in the scriptures, unlike the sons who went about making uh, money dishonestly and basically defiling the office, that's all that happens when you have the wrong people in leadership, the same things happen. What we witnessed even on yesterday is you just see that many of our leaders, they just fall into what they call party lines. Whatever the party is saying, we're going to stay in line with that. But where did you hear any of them say anything in reference to going to actually seek the Lord on how I should actually respond to what is taking place? I'm going to actually seek the Lord and how I'm going to uh, uh, review a bill that's up for consideration. I'm going to actually call on the Lord to, to bless all of the decision makers that are in the House and in the Senate. I'm going to do that because I know that ultimately, if we are having a conversation, government over God, you know, it has to be God. But we don't have that. We don't have that today. We did not have that here either. The people are just looking over into somebody else's yard and saying, hey, it's working for them. And you know why it was working for them? It's because when you are in spiritual bondage, the enemy gives you enough to make it look glorious, 
to make it look like there's you, 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 there are no strings attached, but there's always strings attached when you are dealing in wickedness mm. and evilness. There are always repercussions. And sometimes, like on yesterday, innocent bystanders are part of the equation. People that were just going to a rally just to support their candidate, which is their right according to the government that's in place in the United States. How can you go to a rally that was not controversial, that was not sinister, that was not evil, that may have a point of view that you may not like, but no one was barking about any obscenities or any other negative things that would ultimately affect our country. And yet, this is where the violence happens. And, and while I'm on that rant, isn't it amazing that when you look at the majority of the assassinations in the United States, and we all know the, the trifecta, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert uh, Kennedy, we can see that at least on the surface, all of these men were doing something that should have been for the benefit of the country. Different ways, you may agree or not agree, but definitely not doing anything that would warrant assassination. And yet, we always have that spirit that spirit that has been honed in by people that keep looking over into somebody else's yard. And they want to have what somebody else has, but they don't know the consequences that those folks are going through. And as Myra said, there are repercussions that I'm getting ready to talk about with the decision that is getting ready to be made. So anyway, they wanted a king other than God to be appointed over them. And again, the same mistake that Samuel made in making that decision on his own, did they seek God? No, they went to Samuel. You see how backwards that is? In any, just for the record, any decision-making that you ever have to do even in a marriage, before seeking out a person, seek out God. And you'd be surprised how things that seem to be overwhelming can actually be subdued. Anyway, let me continue. But this request in verse 6, but this request displeased Samuel. And it displeased Samuel because in, in lieu of his era, Samuel still had a heart for God. And he knew that God would be displeased because God would look at it the way I've just expressed, that here they go again. They want somebody other than me or other than the system that I have established for them. They keep falling into idolatry. They keep falling into wickedness. They keep falling into sin. I keep bailing them out. <laughs> and this is how they repay me. And so this request displeased Samuel, for they said, give us a king to lead us. So Samuel finally made the right move. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, do everything the people request of you, for it is not you that they have rejected, but it is me that they have rejected as their king. For you all that are the sold out believers in Christ, this is a verse that you should 
embrace. They are not attacking you, even though you feel the sting. Trust me, I have been in many back and forths with my faith and have been stung many, many times, but I don't even take it personally and I don't hate any of them because I understand it is not because of me, but it's because of the witness of Jesus Christ. We have taken on a pledge of allegiance, not to the flag of the United States. We've taken a pledge of allegiance to deny self, pick up our cross and follow him. They're going to hate you, he tells us, Jesus, that is, for my name's sake. So we know what comes with this territory. I'm just going to say it, the low viewership that I have and that Myra has right now, it's because nobody wants this subject because it doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> it is literally a calling out to stand up and represent our God in the way that he deserves to be represented. In verse eight, just as they have done from the day that I brought them up from Egypt. You, you, don't you notice how they say that God forgets, but God doesn't really forget because God can bring up all the history if you want him to. So he says, just as they have done from the day that I brought them up from Egypt until this very day, they have rejected me and have served other gods. This is what they are also doing to you. So now do as they say, but you must warn them and make them aware of the policies of the king who will rule over them. So Samuel spoke all the Lord's words to the people who were asking him for a king. Now, this is where and Myra intimated this, and we're going to take this on home. Okay, because this is so critical to understand. All you people that hate the United States and want to go to somebody else's kingdom, they want to go to somebody else's place because you think that it might be better. Not even looking at the fact that all those people in these other kingdoms would give their lives, give their mother's lives to come to the United States. Think about that, all right? And, and, and if you do it, take advantage of it for our foreigners while the borders are still open. They won't be for long, trust me. Anyway, listen to this. It says, he said, here are the policies of the king who will rule over you. And, and when I read these, think about how that relates to the United States. He will conscript your sons and put them in his chariot forces and in his cavalry. They will run in front of his chariot. This is a sign that speaks to uh, upcoming conflict. And for all you guys that are looking and saying, but there's no draft, that can turn around in any moment. And believe me right now, our country has put itself in such a position that all of the surrounding nations can see that the armor has a chink in it. And I'm telling you, not trying to play prophet, 
But you watch. And whether they call it an actual draft or whether you're going to have to just pull up with weaponry just to defend your own homes in civil war, hmm. conflict is coming. And it's going to be very real and it's going to stun you because all of the, the news clips that you see of all of the adversities that go on in other countries is coming to the borders of the United States. Why? Because we have allowed for the dreck of the world to enter in without any qualifications. And we have allowed people who do not understand that God should be the leader of our government to come in with concepts that do not reflect God. And in fact, they hate God and they govern your families, your children and the generations that are to come. That's not me being prophetic. That's me stating a fact. <laughs> they say he will appoint for himself, himself leaders of thousands and leaders of fifties, as well as those who plow his ground, reap his harvest and make his weapons of war and his chariot equipment. You can see it now. You see it all over the place. When you get an opportunity, beloveds, look up who's buying the most land in our country right now. Look at who is in control of most of the agriculture in our country right now. And look who should be leaders of industry. We, the natives of the United States, are now being made laborers by foreigners and haters of our country who could care less about the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, or the U.S. Constitution, because they have come with a communist and Marxist agenda to overthrow. But you, beloveds, and I'm talking to the Christians, you, every time you fall for the okie doke, you're saying it's okay. And in fact, you're saying, guess what? I'm going to bend over so you can give it to me in a place that don't shine. That's what you're doing. Every time you play this game, every time you're hating on people, political parties have nothing to do in the construct of things that are of God. All of these social platforms and, and show social justice uh, uh, initiations and institutions have nothing to do with God. And for the religious folks, all of your denominations and all of your practices that are just based upon man-made intellectualism has nothing to do with God. I do believe in Isaiah, it tells us that the government will be upon his shoulders. Christ has a government that is not of this world. And that's the government that we should be tapping into. I'm not saying being disloyal to what's here. I'm saying, but understand that don't let them put you in a place where you're talking about, well, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, I'm this, I'm that. No, you vote the issues if you decide to vote. You vote the person that meets the standards of God. And quite frankly, I'm going to really make some people upset. If nobody uh, is qualified, you don't vote. And let, let things happen. God's got it under control. It's nothing that we worry about. I know that 
the first thing I'm going to hear from the black community, well, you know, our forefathers, they fought for our right to vote, but they did not understand, y'all. It's not just to say, well, just because I got a right to vote, I'm going to just vote for one party or another. And I don't care if they really care about me or not. What we are supposed to do is take everything to God in prayer and let God be the governing factor over our lives. Not a pastor, not a preacher, not me or Myra, none of that. But let God make the decisions. And I guarantee you, you will find out that we will find more similarities with each other than divisions. Let me continue. He will take your daughters to be ointment makers, cooks, mm. and bakers. Now, I know that it's saying ointment makers, cooks, and bakers, but look at what's happening to the women of our world right now. Our women uh, have also fallen for the okie doke in that it's not good enough that a woman would actually have an aspiration to be a good servant of God, mm -hmm. to be a good wife, and to be a loving mother. Somehow that's looked at as somehow being a degradation of your gender. And I'm mystified that the one uniqueness that God has given you, and in fact, not one uniqueness, several uniquenesses in the way that you think, in the way that uh, uh, emotions work through you, in the way that you are biologically set up, you can do so much for the household of faith that whether you have a career outside of the house or not, that that is the most precious thing that you can do. You guys keep going to Proverbs 31 and you keep talking about the virtuous woman, mm. and I'm going to say his name, and Harrison Booker, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, he actually says that. He actually uh, exonifies and, 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 and actually promotes Proverbs 31, and women are angry at him. <laughs> and you say you are Christian. I understand the world. I understand the world. I understand, because I'm going to say it, I'm going to, I understand the Serena Williams and Venus Williams and uh, I forget the other young lady's name that could say publicly horrible things at the ESPYs. I keep up. <laughs> But he only promoted that which was godly. He didn't take away from anything else. He never said they couldn't be athletes. He never said they couldn't excel at, at athletics. But at the end of the day, the greatest gift that God has given to women is, in fact, the right to be able and the ability to be able to bear children, which keeps God's family Moving forward in this earth, no man can do it. Every time, ladies, every time that you are throwing your behind on a, in, in front of a camera as if that's the only asset that you are thinking with, every time that you allow yourselves, because it's not men, you allow yourselves to be sexualized and humiliated 
and seen as breasts and vaginas and buttockses before the world. Every time you expose those things that should only be for your husband, you have set back womankind many, many, many years. And what you call progress mm. and me too and feminism just goes to the degradation of our country. Mm. And our country has become feminized. And men are too, uh, they're too weak to stand up and say, let us lead mm. in the way that God said. Now, I didn't say dictate, I said lead. And you know, in those circumstances, I'm telling you, just look at households. Statistics will tell you <laughs> successful households are ones that have a father, a mother, and children. And we know that there's circumstances sometimes that changes that, and we're not hating on that, but understand that God set the order in the garden that there would be man, woman, child. And we keep doing things just like what's going on here in 1 Samuel 8 to do it our way and change it. And God is not pleased. And the people who follow God are not stupid either. Anyway, verse 14. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his own servants. In other words, he'll take all of your natural resources and give it to his cronies. Hmm. Your, the king that you want. Hmm. Again, this is not about parties. This is just about the system. And you will find that everybody except those who should be in those positions are in those positions. He will demand a tenth of your seed and of the produce of your vineyards and give it to his administrators and his servants. And I think it's interesting that seed because if you want to know the truth, that seed includes the actual seed that comes from a man. He'll take that too. And you know how he takes it? He takes it through means that are not the normal ways of being able to produce children. And you have seed all over the place mm -hmm. in uh, chambers or incubation uh, 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 containers, whatever they, however they're stored. And literally men can create anything out of a man's seed. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This, this, was said thousands of years ago, but it's relevant today. He will take your male and female servants as well as your best cattle and your donkeys and assign them for his own use. In other words, the kingdom that we are choosing to honor will pimp you out. How does that work? Oh, when somebody's on the campaign trail, they'll make all kinds of promises to you. But when it comes to pay up, you can't find them. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Isn't it incredible how we can marry 1 Samuel 8 to what's going on to this very day? And you say the Bible doesn't have prophetic Mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, statements in it. You say that the Bible is not alive. You're saying that God's way is uh, archaic and doesn't matter 
today, but it very much matters. I'm almost done. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will be his servants. And that's where we're coming into. We're coming into a place now where your civil liberties are literally being taken away. And with the advance of technology, you will find that your intellectual property and your natural property will be at the mercy of uh, governmental institutions that could come into your house anytime, raid it, take away everything. Can I say Mar-a-Lago? <laughs> and, and, and you're left exposed, humiliated, and wondering, which way did they go, George? Because we have bought into government over God. Christians, I'm talking to the Christians. That's what we've done. It says, in that day, you will cry out because your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord won't answer you in that day. And that's what we are finding out, that God has taken his hands off of it. He did it. Uh, here with Samuel. Let them have what they want. And you'll find out later that the king that they do get is Saul. And the way it works many times, that it starts off really good. But then you find out that when you get to the core of these administrations, then you get the whammy. Mm -hmm. And then everything falls apart. Because we have put our faith in the institution for every pastor that has allowed any politician of any party to man the pulpit. That is an atrocity to God. The house of worship is holy. It is not for political rallies. It is not for anything other than the promotion of the gospel. If a politician is in your place of worship, they should be worshipers just like you. Their agendas mean nothing in God's house. Look at the money changers. Look at the reaction that Jesus had. That's the reaction we ought to have. Every time some of those charlatans come in and all they care about is advancing their political agendas. You got Obama that can come into your place of worship and just because he sings Amazing Grace, everything gonna be all right. Just because Bill Clinton can come in and blow a saxophone on Arsenio Hall, he's cool now. Just because Biden can sit there uh, in a church service and seemingly not even know what's going on, but he's there. We look at that and say, oh, <laughs> they're relating to my experience. But the devil is a liar. None of that is any good. Even to the local leadership, do your job and then go to the house for prayer. If you feel like you had to go to a house of worship, go there to pray for your administration. Go there to pray for your constituents. Go there to pray for your opponent. <laughs> that in the end, God's will be done, even if it doesn't come through an election victory for you. Wouldn't it be amazing what kind of world we would have then? That we can play the game fairly, best man, best woman, win. And they can go about governing under God's authority as opposed to man's. Let me close this out. But the people refused to heed Samuel's warning. Instead, they said, no, 
there will be a king for us. Remember, this is a warning through, they were said to, uh, by God through Samuel. So again, they rejected God. We will be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us and lead us and fight our battles, which is really giving license. Hey, we're going to mess up, but we know that our, our leader is going to fight our battle because that's all Israel had been doing. That's all the United States has been doing. We not even 250 years old yet. And we have put ourselves as a country in more compromising circumstances, getting into other people's business so much. And up until now, God has spared us like none other. But there are small chinks in that armor, y'all. It started over there uh, with um, Pearl Harbor, because that was the first time, even though it wasn't in the continental United States, but somehow all of a sudden our land got touched. Then, you know, we got 2000, <coughs> uh, 9 11, 2001. And all of a sudden, now things are happening right within our borders. Okay, and not to mention the potential uh, uh, terrorist attacks that are always on the horizon because we have allowed people because of open borders to come in who are ill, legit practices to come in and strategically put things in place that at any point they could wipe us out and we will be left with the pillage of our own stupidity because we did not let God be our leader. The Lord said to Samuel, do as they say and install a king over them. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, each of you go back to his own city. And that's where I'm capping off today as well. Again, we'll find out if you read on that Saul would be brought in as king, and we, we kind of know how that would actually lead to uh, the kingship of David, who, by the way, was picked by whom? God through Samuel, like a judge. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So... So as, as we uh, cap off, I knew that I, I didn't know how this was going to come out because um, we, don't, we don't rehearse these things. But I, I, I knew that God, in the midst of, of sharing this, he would, he would lead both of us. And, you know, like Mara said, we, we might be in a different place as far as how we reacted to this, but the place that we are consistently at and the only place that really matters is that we know that the only thing that overcomes everything that's happening right now is the love of God, the allegiance of God, and the steadfastness Mm -hmm. of our faith. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Myra, is there anything you want to say to mm -hmm. Okay. Well, guys, we pray that in, in all of this, that um, you have a takeaway that is positive, that at least make you think and make you consider how, how we actually are dealing with one another. It's amazing that the God of the old covenant would say eye for an eye. Because that's actually his perfect law. But the law of grace says, if he smites you on one cheek, you turn and give him the other cheek. Doesn't sound great. For some people, it, it seems like a punk move. <laughs> but honestly, guys, uh, we literally just watched a movie last night 
where mm. the protagonist, one of the protagonists had to do just that. He turned the other cheek. And because he turned the other cheek, he gave his children a life lesson that uh, ended up uh, carrying on after his death. And so we are to, as believers and followers of Christ, to have a legacy. Uh, and our, our legacy is established in what we defend, what we fight for. And I fight for Christ. Um, in the same manner, I fight for my family. Um, but we're not going to do things just because everybody else is doing it. And just because it's safe. There's no safety other than the safety of God's provision. And God, whether he allows the attacks to touch you or allows those attacks to go over your head, it is all working together for our good because we are the called and we love God. And he does these things according to his purpose, not ours. God bless you. And God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. God Amen. bless. Bye-bye.